place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in its midst, is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms stutter. He utters his voice. The earth, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, Behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The Lord is my refuge and strength. Therefore I will not be afraid. Though the mountains give way, to the sea He will come and rescue me Lord The Lord comes to me at break of day He reaches down to guide me in His way And though the oceans roll in this dark and stormy Blessed are the ones who do not bury all the broken pieces of their heart. Blessed are the tears of all the weary, pouring like 
make a sky of falling stars.
that one more time. Welcome to our service of lessons and carols on Christmas Eve at Restoration. My name is David Hankey, and I serve as the rector of our parish. Christmas certainly feels different this year, and I've been reminded in several things that I've read of a Christmas that also felt very different when Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote a poem called Christmas Bells. The year was 1863. And eventually that poem, Christmas Bells, became that familiar carol, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was writing in the midst of the Civil War, and he writes of his despair, for his son had been wounded in the war. He writes, there's no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And Longfellow also writes of his faith, He says, then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail with peace on earth, goodwill to men. That poem written over 100 years ago speaks to the tension that we feel this year, the tension that we feel all the time, the tension that we feel at this time and especially in this particular year. In that tension, Longfellow describes the bells being more loud and more deep. And as I think about how our church has responded to all of the circumstances of 2020, I think about how we have pressed deeper, deeper into the reading of Scripture and to the rhythm of prayer. We've asked God to make His voice more loud. We have wanted to grow deep. At Christmas... At Christmas, we remember that the tension doesn't last forever. The wrong shall fail. The right prevail. Now, yes, sorrow, disappointment, tragedy, they are all around us. And as a community, we have walked through them together this year. But in spite of those circumstances, they are not reasons to abandon this most true of stories. What it means is that we actually read it more closely, that we hold it more dearly, and we sing it with more faith. I invite you to stand as we start our lessons and carols. It's Christmas at Restoration. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep, and we are here to worship the Christ. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Behold, The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Let's sing together.
Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let's pray together. O oh God, you have caused this holy night to shine with the brightness of that true light. Grant that we who have known the mystery of that light on earth may also enjoy him perfectly in heaven, where with you and the Holy Spirit he lives and reigns, one God in glory everlasting. Amen. Dear people of God, in this Christmas season, let us make our homes glad with carols of praise. Let it be our delight to hear once more the message of the angels, to go to Bethlehem and see the Son of God lying in the manger. Let us hear in Holy Scripture the story of God's loving purpose from the time of our rebellion against him until the glorious redemption brought to us by his holy child, Jesus. Please be seated as we begin the reading of God's word. A reading from Genesis 3. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of the tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A curious thing happens when we experience a taste of the presence of God. The experience of God, the wholeness, the joy, the beauty of it, is almost always accompanied by the temptation to recreate the experience as God. The longing for God becomes sullied, debased, into the greed to become God. The irony is that in doing so, we turn away from the very presence of God, for the attempt to create our own world where we can be God to manipulate people and things so that we can experience God-likeness for ourselves. And so what Adam and Eve find and what we find is that the temptation to be like God only results in us pushing the very presence of God further and further 
and further away until you can't even recognize the grace and the glory of God himself coming down and walking in the cool of the day in the garden to find you. And so it goes, and so it goes, and so it is gone. I don't even have to read the rest of the story because we have lived in 2020 the brokenness and the tragedy of a world that has fallen and busted. We are well versed in the curse. And so what's the result? Where do we go when all that is left is the longing to be back where we once were? It's really easy to imagine that Adam and Eve on the other side of the wall of the Garden of Eden longing to go back. Their shame only intensified to the point that the longing to go back at this point can only be replaced by God himself coming back, down again, to be with them. And so thankfully, this is only the beginning of the story. A longing in a dark night that gets darker and darker until Jesus is born. the Old Testament, from the time God promised to redeem and restore all things, 
he hinted at just how that redemption would come to pass, what it would look like. The prophet Isaiah was one whom God chose to bring the good news of the kingdom of God to the people of God. He breathed out hope, hope over people who were longing and waiting for an almost but not quite, a not quite but someday, a some day that was coming. I wonder, as you long for this some day, this restoration of all things, how you might see hope in these words from Isaiah, in this picture promise of what was to come. A reading from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
reading from Isaiah chapter 11. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy on my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Several years ago, I was hiking through a forest when I came across a large stand of trees that had blown over in a windstorm. And all of a sudden, the landscape around me changed. It went from being lush and green to looking totally desolate instead. And all I could see were these huge trees as they had collapsed on the forest floor, their branches broken, their leaves turning brown and withered. It was a sad sight because the beauty of these magnificent trees was now gone. The shade they had once offered had disappeared. That storm had left the forest looking very, very barren. I think that's a powerful image of what often happens in our lives as well. Because many times, just like in that forest, storms can blow through our lives. Storms of suffering, or sickness, or loss. And these storms often arrive with unexpected power, destroying what was once so beautiful and verdant. And when they're gone, they often leave us standing among the ruins, so to speak, trying to sift our way through the damage, wondering what just happened. I think the prophet Isaiah knew this experience really well, because as he looked around him in the world in which he lived and surveyed the damage in his own day, what he saw was great loss, because he lived in a time of great anxiety and distress, a time of political turmoil and fear. A time, you might say, that is not too dissimilar from the year 2020. And so it's interesting to notice that in the midst of all this heartache and loss, all this pain and confusion, how the Lord comes to Isaiah and gives him a vision of hope. The Lord says to him, Isaiah, I want you to look on these fallen trees, on this mighty forest of Israel, and as you do, you will see something remarkable. You will see a shoot coming up out of the stump of Jesse, You will see a branch from that tree that will bear much fruit. Meaning that out of all this death and loss will come forth new life. Out of all this heartache and pain will issue new fruit. And this unexpected gift will spring up because of the arrival of the one who is to be born from the line of Jesse. It would emerge from the one who shared the lineage of David. Because God said when he came, He would bring true justice. He would set things right. He would restore what was broken. And it's his birth that we celebrate this evening because he is the one whose birth the angels proclaim to the shepherds. This is the shoot that has come forth from the stump of Jesse. This is the branch that bears much fruit.
the prophet Micah, alive and alert to the voice of God. He was the master of metaphor. The story of Jesus is coming from little Bethlehem, Ephrathah. It's like one we've seen before, isn't it? Remember King David? He was the least of his brothers out in the fields as a shepherd looking after the sheep, and God chose him to rule his people. David, the man after God's own heart. But all the kings that came after David, they were born in proud Jerusalem, and yet they failed. But now, now a Messiah who'd be born a baby in little Bethlehem will triumph. The true good shepherd is coming. He'll care for his flock in the strength of the Lord. And because of him, we, his flock, will dwell secure. He will be our peace. Hear this reading from Micah, chapter 5, verses 2 through 5. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of the brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Christ, the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a great multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest peace on earth among those with him whom he's pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do you remember the first time you heard the story of the birth of Jesus Christ? I do not. Though most of us are familiar with the general story of the birth of Jesus Christ, it may be a challenge to recall the first time you heard it. And I ask you that question because there's something that happens when we hear a story for the first time. The first time we hear a story, there's a vividness as we take it in, the characters, the situation, the awe of it all. We hear about the baby. We discover there's a mommy and a daddy and some angels and shepherds show up. And we're told that this baby is the savior of the world. And what a wonderful story that is. Full of hope for the generations to come. Of new life and new beginnings. And after we have taken the story in, then something else eventually happens. We inevitably have questions. If you're anything like my daughters, one of the questions you will immediately ask is probably, why? And what a beautiful question to ask around the birth of Jesus Christ. Why? Not just in general, but specifically, why? Why was he born? Precisely, why was he born in a feeding trough for animals? This is the story of the birth of the Savior of the world, right? The Son of God. Why did the angels alert the lowly shepherds and not scribes and Pharisees and kings? Why did Mary and Joseph take this long journey to Bethlehem? Mary was late in pregnancy. That doesn't seem like the best time to travel. Why did any of this happen like this? And the only answer, outside of logic and the Roman and Jewish census and the crowded conditions and all those things that could have caused the event to play that way, 
all the plausibility structures we can place around the story, there's only one really correct answer. It is the one that the prophet Jeremiah reminded his people that God has a plan. God always has a plan. And so all of this, everything we see works into the unfolding of that plan. In the Old Testament, as it was just read, Micah prophesied that Jesus would be born in the obscure place of Bethlehem. The specific randomness of this town is a fitting way to show that this event is not a coincidence, but instead it is the fulfillment of God's plan. And why not the shepherds? After all, it was they living a life apart from society that raised and cared for the lambs that were sacrificed at the Jewish altars. They were careful to keep them pure and safe and innocent as was commanded by God so that that sacrifice could fulfill the purpose of cleansing sins. It makes sense that they would be some of the first visitors to see the Lamb of God. And speaking of this world, why have Jesus come into this world in human form in the only place made available to him? a feeding trough, a world that even today acts as if it has no room for him. Why not use Jesus' birth as an opportunity to show that Jesus' life was not supposed to be one of luxury and ease? No, 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 no. He came to be the suffering servant that would love and care for us with his hands and his feet by overcoming the sin of the world, by using his hands and using his feet for the work of the cross. What a beautiful question is the word why. And at the center of all the answers, we find the heart of God, the consistency and the order of his love and his care for us. A 
reading from Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 4. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A mosaic is a picture with many pieces. It's a picture that is told in many ways. And the writer to Hebrews says that this story that we heard tonight has been told at many times and in many ways and with many pieces. Jesus is the full picture. And what has been expressed many times in many ways can now be seen in one utterly unique Savior. He's the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus shows us what God is like. Jesus is firm and unwavering. He is gracious and so generous. He is compassionate, creative, clever, so brave. Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. He is wise. He has agency. He chooses to do the will of his Father. He chooses to drink his cup. For some of you, life seems like it is careening into chaos, and you wonder who's in charge of this thing. The mosaic just seems to be shattering and splintering into pieces, and that might be some stories, but that's not this story. That's not the story we read tonight. In this story, Jesus holds it together. He does. And Jesus is the one who made purification for sins. His generous love, his willful choice, meant that Jesus chose to become that Lamb of God, to become whom the shepherds had waited for to be the one who would substitute himself in our place. That's the story we told tonight. It's the story that was told long ago, many times, in many ways. There are many pieces. But now all those pieces that have lied disparate in many places have been brought together in one person, in one story, in one clear message. God created all of this. He loved us, and he said it was good. We broke it. We had a lot of help from sin, the flesh, and the devil, but it was we, at the end of the day, each of us who wandered off, and we chose to give something else our devotion, our allegiance, our trust, and our worship. Even though what we wanted was by very nature not a God, and even though what we wanted would ultimately fail us as a God, God still wanted us. And so God looked for us. He became like us, and he loved us by living with us and then dying for us. All of the pieces are important, and when they are brought together in his story we find our place, we find our home, and we invite you at this Christmas to come home, come home. 2020 has been an interesting chapter in the story of our lives. Moments of suffering and great sadness, probably more infrequent than we like, but moments of mirth and delight. On this night, in this chapter, in this story, we give thanks that God showed up with his son to speak what he had been saying at many times and in many ways. Surely, surely the Lord is coming soon. 
For in these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. I invite you to pray with me, to pray for this year, to pray for the things that God has done. I invite you to pray for our needs and for the needs of the world. Heavenly Father, we begin by praying for the needs of the whole world, for peace and justice on earth, for the unity and mission of the church for which Jesus died. And we pray especially for Restoration Anglican Church, and we pray for our neighbor churches in Arlington, Virginia. I invite you to pray for the church. And because Christ particularly loves them, we remember in Jesus' name the poor and helpless the cold, the hungry, and the oppressed, the sick and those who mourn, the lonely and unloved, the aged and little children, as well as all those who do not know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. I invite you to pray for those who are in need this night. And Father, we pray for an end to the pestilence of COVID-19. We give you thanks for vaccines, and we ask for their safe and efficient distribution. We pray for those who are sick and ask for effective therapies that they would be made well. And we pray for those who are sad and alone and far, that soon, soon, Lord Jesus, we would again be close and see each other in real life. Father, we pray for our Christmas outreach partner, Arlington Bridge Builders. Thank you for their work to see the most vulnerable in our county. Thank you for their work to show them the light of Christ. We are grateful to get to partner with them in this season. And now I invite you to join me that our intercessions would be come together and we will use the response, hear our prayer. Christ, for whom there was no room in the inn, give courage to all who were homeless. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Christ, who fled into Egypt, give comfort to all refugees. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Christ, who fasted in the desert, give relief to all who are starving. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Christ, who hung in agony on the cross, give strength to all who suffer. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the church, hear our prayer and make us one in heart and mind to serve you to serve you with joy forever and ever as we say together this prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us in this service of Lesson and Carols tonight. We are grateful for the chance to remember this story with you. Every year at Restoration for Christmas Eve, we take up a financial offering And then we give it away to one of our outreach partners. We don't keep any of it for ourselves. Normally, we would do that in our sanctuary. We do it with great joy. Tonight, we do it remotely, and we do it by way of our giving portal. And so if you go to Restoration Arlington slash give, you will find our giving portal, and you will have the opportunity to give to our Christmas outreach partner, Arlington Bridge Builders. They will be one of the items that you can choose on the drop-down menu. We'll have this open for the next few days until the end of the calendar year. 
We invite you to give generously. We love the work that they're doing. We're so grateful that they see those who are on the margins, those who need help with rent assistance and food assistance. And we invite you to join with us as a church to give to them generously for the work they are doing to be the light of Christ in our county and beyond. And now, with great joy, we close our service by singing together this hymn of mirth and delight, Joy to the World. Now, may Almighty God, who sent his Son to take our nature upon him, bless you in this holy season. May God scatter the darkness of sin and brighten your heart with the light of his holiness. Amen. May God, who sent his angels to proclaim the glad news of the Savior's birth, fill you with joy and make you heralds of the gospel. Amen. And may God, who in the Word made flesh, joined heaven to earth and earth to heaven, give you his peace and favor. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas.
We are so very glad that you joined us today for this broadcast of Restoration Anglican Church. If you'd like more information, please go to the front of our website at restorationarlington.org and type in your information. We would love to hear from you. And to stay up to date with our next broadcast, announcements, and weekly rector updates, go ahead and hit subscribe. You can click the bell icon as well so you are sure to not miss a thing. We look forward to seeing you this week or on Sunday.